welcome back to the black track where I do commentary and review on movies with an all-black cast, or at least a black lead. Remember how back in the day, when HBO would show a random movie for like a month straight, and then completely forget about its existence? Well, today's movie is one such movie, one that I remember fondly, but also completely forgot about for 30 years. That movie is Living Large, a 1991 comedy film directed by Michael Schultz, yep, THE Michael Schultz, who brought us movies such as Cooley High, Car Wash, Crush Groove, and The Last Dragon. I would say, if you like those movies, you'll like Living Large, but it's so different from its usual work that I'm not so sure I can say that with confidence. That's a good thing though, because as I mentioned in many videos before, sometimes it's good to branch out and do something a little different than the normal. Living Large tells the story of Dexter Jackson, a guy who works at a dry cleaners and has dreams of making it big. Wow, where have I heard that one before? Unlike the usual setup though, Dexter actually wants to be a news anchor, so at least the movie tries to draw you in with a premise that's never seen in black films from this time period. Dexter is played by Terrence T.C. Carson, an actor who I assume doesn't need an introduction because I'm sure most people recognize him from his role as Kyle Barker on a super successful TV show Living Single. Living Large was his first credited movie role, and it actually beat the TV show to the screen by two years. He went from Living Large to Living Single. Sounds kinda backwards. He's co-starring with actress Lisa Arendelle in only her second movie role and who you might recognize from the movie Clockers and Medea's Family Reunion. He's also backed up by longtime actress Loretta Devine. I remember recording Living Lodge on VHS back in the day because you never knew when a movie would come back on TV back then. And considering how hard it was to find a DVD for this video, I think that was a good idea. Was it worth it to spend the amount of money I did for a movie this old and obscure? Let's black track and find out. Living Large starts out going all out, with not just narration, but that weird fourth wall breaking narration like we got in the wood. For as long as I've known him, he always wanted to be on TV. Me, I just wanted to watch. I give it a pass though, because Dexter's friend Baker is such a down for the cause dude. He probably doesn't even believe in Dexter's dreams, but sometimes being a friend is preventing a friend from getting into trouble like getting ddt by old ladies getting off the bus. Baker is played by Nathaniel Hall, sometimes referred to as Africa Baby Bam or just Baby Bam, named after the legendary Africa Bambata. He was a member of the rap group The Jungle Brothers, a highly influential group who inspired the style of acts like A Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul. To date, Nathaniel Hall has only acted in this and one other movie. Dexter helps to run a dry cleaners in Atlanta, Georgia, with his girlfriend Toynell and his sister Nadine, played by Loretta Devine. Yep, you heard that right. And I repeat, his sister Nadine. Loretta Devine isn't playing somebody's mama in this movie for a change. She might as well be his mama though, with the way she's sassing him around. You and that Ajax School of Broadcasting is about to drive me out of business. Hey, I never thought about it before, but if you're somebody like Dexter, an aspiring street reporter, then working at a dry cleaners is a pretty sweet gig because you can just wear whatever customer's clothes fits the situation. It's genius. Although in hindsight, now I'm low key second guessing if somebody wore my clothes before I got them back from the cleaners. Is that Axe body spray? There's a hostage situation going down. And since when does the media overrule the police? These people love putting themselves in danger. I don't know which new situation is worse. The ones at active crime scenes or the ones where they stand in the middle of a hurricane. I'm Charles Hempstead, coming to you live. Oh. oh my god, what happened? He just screwed it up. Well, I guess it's this one. Screw this guy though. He was an asshole anyway. He may look like him and talk like him, but he was nothing like that Trevor on the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. At least that guy went out doing something cool. This guy definitely won't be missed. And if you don't believe me, look at how fast his fellow news people move on with their lives. But a commercial in five, four. Three. No, no, stay with this. If you can't tell by now, living large is silly and absolutely not to be taken seriously. And that's all right with me. What's that they say on social media memes? That you miss all the opportunities that you don't take? Well, that's a mantra that Dexter Jackson can get behind because he takes the mic right out of a dead man's hand and continues on with the report like it's nothing. In fairness, he doesn't know he's dead yet. Yo, and just moments ago, he shot and killed? Shot and killed, Charles Hempstead. Okay, now he knows, but hell, it's too late now. What kind of scouts are these with all this firepower? I didn't have any of this stuff when I was in the scouts. 
just Walmart badges and cookouts. Dexter channels his inner Jesse Jackson and not only frees the hostages, but prevents this guy from taking the deep throat challenge. All these happenings are really starting to turn on producer Kate, and she's about ready to pop. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 you national TV, man, what's up with you? I mean, yo, I, I, fuck, I, I mean, channel four, right? Pull that trigger. Oh, yes. You gonna do exactly what they write there on TV, man. Yes, do it. You wanna do that for them, man? Dexter not even in the room in the brother snatching that soul. Keep on the dive, There's a guy in my hometown doing this exact kind of hood news coverage. And I know he's not the only one in the country. It seems like this movie was a little ahead of his time when it comes to giving these type of dudes a chance. His performance at the hostage situation earns Dexter a spot on the news doing street stories from inside his own neighborhood. Basically, the same thing he was already doing, but with a bigger budget. But this is where the movie starts showing its ass when it comes to the portrayal of black people. See? They want Dexter on TV, but not the real Dexter. And I get dressing him up a little bit to make him presentable, but they have Kate treating him like he's some kind of savage or something. Like in this scene where she tries to teach him how to properly say the word ask. 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 The word is ask. Look, this is an ask. Yeah, all right, all right, ask. That's it. Dude was speaking just fine up to this point. Not a single is you or I be came out of his mouth. I think it was the Martin show that had the line, what's next, you gonna give me a big ass and a flat top? Well, funny you should ask, because yep, that's exactly what they did next. That was an Arsenio Hall joke by the way, and it's obvious that that's the look that they were going for with Dexter here. Because of course, you couldn't just have your own identity, uh uh, every black man back then on TV had to look, act, and dress just like Arsenio. Dexter's reports start out great especially his first one, where he sees how long it takes the cops to get to a black neighborhood versus a white one. An emergency dispatch? Look, there are five guys laying here shot and stabbed. What's the location? I'm at the corner of Halsted Street and Boulevard Northeast. All right, we got it. Look, can you hurry up, please? These five guys, they're laying here dying. It's been over two hours and not even one patrol car has driven by to take a look at the scene. There's a woman down here who has on high heels, and when she stepped up on the curb, she may have twisted her ankle. Oh, what's your location, sir? I'm at the corner of Fawn Glen and Bunny Road. He didn't even finish the sentence. Don't white knights had the horses ready. Kate is none too impressed by it, though. And I like that her character is an honest and true-to-life portrayal of cutthroat and amoral media people because she says right off top that she's only about the ratings and can give a damn if the story is true or not. You can't be out here highlighting black issues. We put you on TV to be the token Negro who can say all the bad things about the blacks that we can't say. Dexter gets right on that and immediately exposes his childhood barber for running numbers out of the shop and also ruins the business of an old woman who runs a soul food restaurant out of what looks like her house. Yo, that's actually a cool concept. Yeah, it's kind of small since it's a house and all, but the idea of a soul food restaurant that looks like an old southern lady's house sounds like money to me. I wonder if this place was real. People usually call this kind of behavior selling your soul. And in this case, it might be literal because living large starts getting supernatural on us. Dexter becomes a contestant on what I'm calling the Michael Jackson challenge because his face starts to slowly change during the course of the movie whenever he watches his reports back on tape. The first thing that happens is his nose and lips get thinner. So I'll say, He's about at the Thriller album at this point. This could have been an episode of The Twilight Zone. Well, who knew being a newsman was so lucrative? I took the wrong profession, I guess. That's what we get for making fun of those kids in the mass communication classes back in high school. Dexter not only gets a new car, and I'm not a car man, but I'm gonna assume it's nice for 1991, but he also gets a new apartment or condo or whatever the hell this is. Actually, what the hell is this? Why is there no color? Is this a do-it-yourself paint job house? Ah, oh, I get it. It's all white because you know Dexter's selling out and all, and low key that's what he's becoming. Oh, I see. Clever. Check out the name of the place also. It's right in your face. To be honest, the racial aspects do get a little more heavy handed towards the middle of the movie. But to be fair, it would have been perceived far differently back in the day than it would be now, even to white audiences. The first thing we're going to have to do is throw a party and invite the whole neighborhood out. That's a terrible idea with all this white. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge how fine Toy Nail is? I feel like I've been dismissing her this entire video. 
It's bad enough that Kate wants to replace her as Dexter's girlfriend with the weather girl Missy, but she also has to deal with all the changes in Dexter's voice and mannerisms. Speaking of transformations. This has been Dexter Jackson at Animators. Yeah, we're about at the bad album now. My favorite Michael Jackson album, by the way. What is this James Brown shit? Hey, that works too. I got good hair. I ain't never had good hair. What is that? Not that line though. That doesn't work for me at all. Like I said earlier, Living Large has mild supernatural elements. Because how else do you explain a black man losing his ability to dance and stay on beat? It's funny to watch because to Missy, he's killing it. But to Toy Nail, the only thing he's killing is the vibe. So she leaves him at the club. Hey, there's Baker with the Jungle Brothers. So uh, is this supposed to be Baker? Or is this a completely different guy? Is this actually the Jungle Brothers in this universe? I'm so confused. It's always kind of amazed me in movies how characters can black out to the point that they have no idea how they got home or what they did after leaving a place, but are still coherent enough to have sex. Tornell catches Dexter in bed with Missy, who seems suspiciously sober in this situation. Did she drug this man? Her and Kate did scheme this after all. I see Dexter was coherent enough to put on these ugly ass underrules. Damn dude, you too old for that. Yeah, you better run Missy. That's an Atlanta woman right there. Dexter is down so bad, he done forgot how to baby baby please his way back into a black woman's heart. Where's Joe to see when you need him? No more, baby, I don't give a damn anymore. Instead, Dexter gets torn to pieces by the family dog for his trouble. Come on, Kratos. I've seen you deal with dogs better than this. Now you would think that losing your girl and then losing your TV spot to Missy would be enough for Dexter to finally start remembering his roots. But nah, he has dinner with Baker and finds out that a friend that they grew up with is going to commit a robbery. So you know what that means to a news vulture. Side note, hey, this really is actually filmed in Atlanta. There's the Coca-Cola factory museum in the background. If you live in Georgia, I guarantee you've been there at least three times in your life. Minimum. Dexter not only gets the story, but also gets their friend arrested on the spot and gets Baker put in the hospital because everybody thinks he's a snitch. Eh, in a roundabout way, he kinda is. What did he think Dexter was gonna do with that info? Dexter sold out another friend, so you know what that means. Whoa, 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 whoa wait. It's as if the Cadillac holds some mystical attraction for these people. Oh, this is getting dangerous. Actually, he kinda looks like Beavis on this one. I gotta say, the makeup is amazing. It doesn't look like T.C. Carson at all under all that, but he's under there. At this point, Living Large kind of completely falls apart story-wise, but whether that's good or bad depends on your perspective, I guess. All throughout the movie, Dexter had kind of a mentor, an old guy who he looked up to because he was the anchor for many years. That guy slowly loses his mind and shoots a gun on air. So Dexter is next in line to replace him, but Kate doesn't want him to do it by herself. She wants Missy to anchor with him, but she's all about ratings, remember? And what's the most controversial way to get ratings for your anchors? Why, a taboo interracial marriage, of course. That'll get the people talking. From here on out, the last 20 minutes is all about this fake wedding, and I would call it the craziest wedding I've ever seen in a movie if I didn't believe most of it could happen in real life with how crazy fake reality TV is these days, even on the so-called news. The only unrealistic part is Dexter's complete transformation into the Blood on the Dance Floor album. It leans real heavily into stereotypes at the end too, but at least all the bad people get what's coming to them, and Dexter and his mentor get to anchor the new show format together. But wait a minute, what about all those people's lives and businesses that he ruined? They can't just go back to being normal. Actually, if it made his barber go legit, and the old lady cook healthier food, then I guess it kind of worked out. Baker though, oh Baker is f***ed. Let's get to the grade. I want to first start out by saying that Michael Schultz and MGM are brave people for releasing Living Large in 1991. They probably didn't plan it this way, but Living Large came out in the same year as Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, House Party 2, New Jack City, The Five Heartbeats, and Boys in the Hood. It didn't have a chance in hell of standing out and only made a little over $5 million on a who knows what budget. Despite that, it's still a very funny and highly entertaining movie. What Living Large and all those other movies released in 1991 tells me is that once upon a time, 
black movies had variety. To me, Living Large stands out among those other films because sometimes you just go to see something fun and silly. It didn't have to be a masterpiece and I don't think Michael Schultz really set out to make one. He had plenty of acclaimed films under his belt by this point, so he had nothing to prove. It's not like it's a bad movie either. It's competently acted and genuinely funny comedy. The race aspect could have been handled a little better and the ending may be shortened a little bit, but I still like it just as much as I did all those years ago when I used to watch it on HBO. Probably even more now since the adult humor lands a lot better. My grade for Living Large is a D+. It's a fun and silly movie that probably would have reached cult status had it been more widely available. And that's it for this episode of The Black Track. As usual, let me know what you thought about the movie Living Large in the comments below. And don't forget, for any movie requests, post on the Black Media Man Cave Twitter page so I can keep track of them easier. And also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'll holler at you.